sound of that explosion. Eyes closed and hands over your eyes. It was a bit like thunder, but it was constant. When the flash went off, I could see the bones of my hands. And there it was. The H-bomb cloud. In 1952, Britain began an era of nuclear testing. It lasted around 10 years and involved 22,000 young men. You could see the, the, the ball of flame and crazy getting higher and higher. The most evil looking thing I've ever seen. The government at the time viewed the tests as essential. Who is going to protect the UK? Who is going to protect the British Isles? Britain wanted to be at the top table. They wanted an atomic bomb with a Union Jack on it. Most of the veterans involved have now passed away and many blame the nuclear fallout they were exposed to for their eventual deaths. The true impact on their health will never really be known. But how did a tiny island come to develop its own nuclear bomb? What happened to these young men all those years ago? And how crucial was this huge military operation to our nuclear deterrent today? Do you think people know about the tests? Well, I don't think they do, you know. I really, truly don't think they do. Throughout World War II, Britain worked with the US on the Manhattan Project to develop the world's first atomic bomb. US spending on the endeavour dwarfed the UK's, but with many eminent scientists having fled Europe to escape Nazism, Britain had become a hub of intelligence. With their brains and US resources, the bomb came to be. It was released over Hiroshima. Let us pray that peace now restored to the world, that God will preserve it always. But soon after the war had ended, concerned about leaks of intelligence, the US shut the UK and Canada out of their nuclear program. This left Britain feeling extremely vulnerable. I think there was a lot of concern, a lot of worry, particularly once the, uh, the USSR tested their first atomic bomb, which came a lot earlier than intelligence estimates even the United States predicted, which was in 1949 when they detonated Joe Wong. I think the UK had to put itself in that position and thought, well, who is going to protect the UK? Who is going to protect the British Isles? Would the United States come to our aid, indeed, if there was an atomic attack? in Europe or on UK soil and therefore having our own nuclear deterrent within that situation I think became quite important. They saw this as key to the maintenance of Britain as an international imperial power and if Britain was going to have access to the top table then having the atomic bomb and then subsequently the hydrogen bomb was absolutely decisive in that. Dick Richard like that. Thank you, thank you and much. John are all nuclear test veterans and amongst the few humans on Earth who've witnessed a nuclear bomb. What did you have for breakfast this morning, John? What, what, oh, well, I had my normal egg and bacon. John's job was to fly through the mushroom cloud minutes after the bomb had been detonated in order to gather data for scientists. A notice came round looking for crews to go on special duties to fly out in Australia. The requirement was that we all had to be single people and uh, really that, that was it, and that qualified. And they called it special duties? Special duties, yes, that's what we were told until we started to find out exactly what it was all about. <laughs> as a National Serviceman, I decided to get as much out of it and see as much as I could in the two years. But after I'd finished my basic training, I was posted to Shoreham by sea, which I found rather disappointed seeing as I could virtually walk home every day. So, as soon as it came up on the notice board, volunteers wanted for Australia, that really appealed to me, so I applied. I think I knew that uh, it was going to be an atomic test, but uh, it didn't, that didn't particularly worry me because at the time, uh, that's, it didn't seem all that major. It just, I thought it was, it was trying to be the best country in the world, or most advanced, to have, to have these weapons. 
So to sort of do something to bring it forward, I was quite happy to do. You were going to be asked to fly through nuclear clouds once the devices have been exploded. Um, nobody seemed to worry too much about that. Um, well, I suppose we were still young and foolish in those days and, <laughs> and got, got on with it. And why was it you wanted to do it? It was an opportunity to go to Australia for a starter, but also a very, very interesting project as far as we could see going on. So you saw it as quite exciting opportunity? Oh, very much so, yes. But whilst John and Dick had volunteered for these special military yeah, duties, right. Richard was a civilian, a young boy aboard a Royal Fleet auxiliary ship who'd run away to sea to escape his abusive father. He too found himself in the middle of testing a nuclear bomb. We came to Christmas Island and none of the crew thought anything of it until we were told there's going to be an H-bomb uh, detonation called Operation Grapple. The crew <laughs> promptly downed tools. It would have been a mutiny had, it, had we have been in the armed forces. We were told that if we decided to go to Fiji for a couple of three days uh, to rest and relaxation, which means getting drunk as a skunk, would we then just come back and, and stand off Christmas Island, which reluctantly the crew decided to do. Britain's nuclear testing programme was an infrastructural project like never seen before, the largest tri-service operation since D-Day. The Navy required... Information on effects of various types of atomic explosions on ships and their contents. The RAF needed information on the effect against airfields. And the Army must discover the detailed effects of explosions on equipment, stores and men, with and without protection. The tests took place mainly at the Montebello Islands, Maralinga and Christmas Island, with the full agreement of the Australian government, who saw this not only as essential for their own defence, but also championing Australia as a pioneer of new technology. It opened up a new frontier of science, and part of that frontier was understanding the effects of ionising radiation upon people, and part of it was understanding it upon animals and ecologies and environments. There were specialist groups involved in this. There were the so-called indoctrinee forces who were instructed to crawl through radioactive fallout after tests. In retrospect, it looks outrageous. There were different standards of medical ethics back then. Britain fires its first H-bomb to join the United States and Russia as ranking atomic powers. The thermonuclear device was fired high over its target in the Christmas Islands, keeping fallout at a minimum. But the test added heat to the mounting debate over the safety of atomic tests and came to on the eve of renewed disarmament talks between Russia and the West. I saw three bombs go off. The first bomb wasn't very, didn't seem very big. A bit disappointing, but in actual fact, I think that was about the same size as the one at Hiroshima. We weren't very happy about being locked uh, above. The, the, the hatch came down and click, 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 and it was locked. So we, we were in a steel coffin, in effect. I could just hear this tannoy-type voice. We heard bomb gone, and then nothing, and then suddenly this, this flash of light, which penetrated through the, it must have penetrated through solid steel. I've never got to know how that could have happened. We felt uh, this, this push of the ship, and I thought, oh God, if we're gonna go over, we're, we're in trouble. But no, she came right. He came over the tannoy, I think, that said that, said that uh, everybody got a report to the uh, airfield. We had our back to where the explosion was gonna be. We were told to cover up our our eyes with our hands. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, flash. About turn. But 
that when that said flash, my shadow from the Australian sun was there, but it disappeared and I could feel the heat down my back and my arms and my legs. And it was, and it was quite, it was quite worrying at the time. The hatch was opened, fresh air, thank God, fresh air. Um, and I could breathe this fresh air in. And then I looked at where everybody was stood, stock still, no talking. And everybody was just looking. And I just heard, oh my God, oh God above, oh, look at that, dreadful. This spectre of, uh, the, the mushroom cloud forming and, and, and sort of boiling, as it were, uh, is, is a, a dreadful feeling. The sound of that explosion, it was a bit like thunder, but it was constant, a constant rumbling. I think we was all, all in awe of the, of, the, of the size of that particular bomb. And it was, uh, it was quite frightening. After the device had gone off, it, the cloud was still rising, but when the up currents had really um, stopped, but then there was the time to go into the clouds and collect the samples that the scientists needed. Were you given any protective measures at all or not? Not really, no. We were kept ourselves on 100% oxygen, so it was a positive pressure going into our lungs the whole time. Um, and that was really the only other thing. Otherwise, we were in normal flying kit and quite happy with that. Yep. They were unsure what effect it was going to have on the human body. They hadn't a clue. And subsequently, of course, they are finding out now that several people have suffered badly from it. And uh, touching wood, <laughs> um, I'd be one of the lucky ones who, who escaped. They was actually flying through the cloud to trace where it was that uh, that couldn't have been very good for, for, the, for the air crew. And, and these were all officers. But then, of course, when the planes come back, they were washed off once again by people, national servicemen like me. I think the danger w was far greater for them, far greater. But I don't think anybody was really aware of it at the time. The ocean was full of dead fish. It, you, you, you couldn't see anything but dead fish for miles around. The, the detonation must have, the blast must have killed thousands and thousands and millions of fish of all sizes and shapes. I'm convinced that we were guinea pigs. That's why we were there and that's why we were all on, on the, on, on the uh, airstrip exposed. Otherwise, that I said there's going to be an atomic explosion, so go in an underground bunker or something. But they didn't say that. I think that we was part of the experiment. It seems a bit primitive looking back on it, but I suppose at the time, that was the best way to find out things. Britain carried out 45 nuclear tests in total. But take a look at this. Here's Hiroshima at 15 kilotons. Hurricane, Britain's first, was 25. Then came a whole host of further atomic tests. With Operation Grapple came Britain's first H-bomb at 1.8 megatons, then another at 3 megatons. That's well over 100 times bigger than Hiroshima. But these are all dwarfed by the largest ever nuclear weapons test. Tsar Bomba detonated by the Soviet Union in 1961. The bomb itself was the size of a bus and weighed 27,000 kilograms. It had a blast yield of 50 megatons of TNT, 3,000 times as powerful as Hiroshima. It broke windows 560 miles away and created the biggest man-made explosion in history. Britain's progress in nuclear testing over the course of a decade prompted the US to rethink the relationship with their friends across the pond. In 1958, the UK-US Mutual Defence Agreement was signed, allowing the two nations to exchange nuclear materials, technology and information once again. Testing alongside the US resumed from the 1960s through to 1991. I feel quite proud of it, actually, because we said then we, were, we became the third nation who had an H-bomb at the end of the day. It's very tempting, particularly for government figures, to draw a straight line between those tests and our security today. Of course, there is an element of truth in suggesting that 
those tests were pivotal. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to develop nuclear weapons without them. They allowed us to develop contacts and networks, um, diplomatic contacts and networks in particular that were important. They gave us a role in NATO, a heightened role. They cemented our relationship with the United States, which is still crucial to our nuclear deterrent today. So they are not to be underestimated at all. At the same time, we shouldn't overestimate them. We talk about having an independent nuclear deterrent. Well, we don't. We have one that is reliant upon the support of the United States. So today, on our own, we are nothing? Effectively, yes. In 1996, the UK agreed to stop testing nuclear weapons altogether when it signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But what do the veterans think of the tests all these years later? I don't regret taking part in the test at all. No, not at all. But there again, I'm fortunate and I feel terribly sorry for those that took part in it and, well, died very soon afterwards. The fact that the government still don't really accept any, any responsibility for it, I think that's, that's what's a shame. We felt we were, we were poorly treated because, as I say, we were not um, troops. We were not trained for anything, but right in the middle of an H-bomb test. 16-year-old um, schoolboy, not good news. To me, it seemed as though we were just used as fodder. I think I'm a bit unique. There's not many, at least of all now, there's not very many now that have actually seen a bomb go off. And, and felt the heat of it. This all seems such, such a long time ago now, it's a different world almost. Thanks for watching. For more from Forces News, like and subscribe to our channel.